All right, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this public session of the committee on research at multiple scales, a vision for continental scale biology. Um, my name is Jack Liu. I'm a professor at Michigan State University, also the committee chair. The committee's work is being conducted under the sponsorship of the National uh, Academy of Sciences um, uh, Engineering and Medicine in response to a request for, from the National Science Foundation. The committee's statement of task is available on the National Academy's website. Today, the committee will hear a presentation on the committee's statement of task by Dr. Matt Kane of the National Science Foundation. Committee members will then have opportunity to ask questions about the statement of task and NSF's vision for the study. The committee and the presenters will not entertain any questions from persons outside of the committee. After the committee, however, anyone who wish to submit uh, written state comments or other materials that are relevant to our charge should contact Dr. Cliff Duke, the um, responsible staff officer for this study. I would like to emphasize that this is a information gathering session and the comments made by individuals should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the national academies. And I want to note that this entire session is on the record and is being recorded. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to ask the committee members to briefly introduce themselves to the audience and indicate the affiliation. Uh, Jenny. I don't believe Jenny is on there. Oh, yeah, I saw Hi. Hi, yes, Hi. I'm Janine Cavender Bears. I'm in at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior. I'm a plant physiological and evolutionary ecologist and connect remote sensing to plant function across scales. Thank you. Uh, Bala. Hi, my name is Bala Chaudhry. I'm a professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth College, and I am a soil ecologist. Thank you. Uh, Brian. Hi, Matt. We miss you here in Tucson. Um, <laughs> I'm a macroecologist and plant uh, interest in plant ecophysiology and questions of scaling up in ecology. And so it's good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, Jack Gilbert. Uh, yeah, uh, Jack Gilbert, Professor of um, Pediatrics and Oceanography and Associate Vice Chancellor for Marine Science at University of California, San Diego, um, and have a long history of doing large-scale microbiome analysis um, of soils, terrestrial systems, aquatic systems, um, atmosphere, um, and have worked with Matt in the past. Thank you. Uh, Louis. Hi, my name is Louise Glass. I'm in the Plant and Microbial Biology Department at the University of California at Berkeley. I work on fungi, primarily using a systems biology um, <clears throat> approaches. Uh, I, I didn't see Scott here. Is Scott here now? Uh, Stephanie. Hi, Matt. I'm Stephanie Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> you may remember me from having worked with me. Um, I'm deputy director of the uh, Biosphere Sciences and Engineering Division at Carnegie Institution for Science in Pasadena. Thank you. Uh, Ines. Hello, I'm Ines Ibanez at the University of Michigan, and I'm a global change ecologist. Thank you. Chelsea. Hi, Matt. My name is Chelsea Ford Miniot. I work at the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station, where I am a program manager of a dryland um, ecosystem program that spans six states across the Intermountain West. And um, the focus of my program is to look at the impacts of climate change and climate variability on um, ecosystems in the Intermountain West across scales and I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Great, thank you. Shahid? 
Hey, Matt, this is Shahid, um, and uh, I'm a professor of ecology at Columbia University in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. And my research focuses on the ecosystem service and functional consequences of biodiversity loss. I don't have any particular taxonomic or ecosystem uh, um, focus. My lab works on just about everything. I'm currently working in the Arctic and um, in temperate forests. I'm really interested in being able to scale up uh, what happens when you lose biodiversity to ecosystem services across scales. Great, thank you. Um, we have another committee member, uh, Phoebe. She is not able to join us today, but uh, we'll have this recording she can watch later. So now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter uh, today, uh, Dr. Matt Kane. He is a deputy uh, division director of the National Science Foundation. And he has spent uh, more than 23 years at the NSF and uh, Dr. Ken has served as the uh, program director and at both the Division of Environment Biology and Division of Molecular and the Cell uh, Cellular Biosciences and as the uh, acting deputy division director. He has managed or co-managed um, more than a dozen different programs and uh, the review of uh, over 3,000 proposals and has worked with colleagues throughout the foundation and with many other federal agencies. In, in addition to his current role in ecosystem science clusters, and Dr. King is the managing uh, program director for the Environment Data Science Inclusion and Innovation Lab. This is a new lab, uh, leads the uh, microsystem biology and the NEON enabled science program. Dr. King is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and has chaired the General and Applied Microbiology uh, Division Group of the American Society for My 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 um, My uh, Microbiology. Before he joined NSF, he held positions at the Smithsonian Institutions and uh, Harvard University. And, and was a NSF postdoc fellow at the University of Illinois. And Dr. Kane received his BS in biology at the University of Michigan and his PhD in microbiology at Michigan State University. Um, now, uh, Dr. Kane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much for that nice introduction, uh, Jack. And uh, thanks to everybody on this committee for um, agreeing to serve and for the work you're going to be doing. Uh, uh, really appreciate that. I'm gonna start sharing my slides. Okay. Everybody see that? Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay. Um, First thing I wanted to mention to the committee is, um, you know, obviously you're going to be uh, working and meeting and and hearing lots of people talk over the next uh, however long it takes um, uh, to uh, put together a report. But um, it's important before you put together your report to see what other reports are out there. And uh, I'm I'm confident that Cliff. Uh, and his staff at uh, the National Academy will help make these available to you. Um, there are at least a couple of uh, National Academy or NRC reports. There's, of course, a very important NEON report that, uh, you know, came out uh, over 15 years ago now um, uh, from the National Academy. It had a big impact on NSF's development of the National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, there's also uh, the report, A New Biology for the 21st Century. Um, and um, then uh, there's there's uh, also, um, you can have a look at the uh, advisory committee to the biology directorate. Um, you know, in recent years, for example, they've produced a report on helping to enable the uh, user community for NEON. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we were, we're ho and, and there's reports from other agencies such as NASA's uh, new report on remote sensing. 
So um, we're, we're, we're hoping that um, uh, this report is going to do something new. It's going to look forward and um, provide a, a, a vision in particular for um, understanding biological phenomena at continental scale, okay? Um, let's see if I can advance these, there we go. So the biology directorate at NSF is divided into four divisions um, and three of these divisions uh, encompass different parts of biological scale. Molecular and cellular biosciences covers the molecular on up into the organismal scale. Integrative and organismal systems, IOS, uh, starts down at the cellular level and moves up into the community level. And then finally, the division of environmental biology that I'm in um, spans things at the, the organism population level on up to the biosphere and even the planet. Um, and then we have a, a division of biological infrastructure that um, provides um, various program opportunities that span this whole um, scale of size. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, not coincidentally, um, the infrastructure that known as NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, uh, currently the larger largest producer of open environmental biology data in the world, um, is managed out of the Division of Biological Infrastructure. Um, NSF has also, um, uh, the bio director at NSF has been interested in um, integrative activities of a variety of types. Um, we had uh, a series of uh, no innovation uh, workshops on reintegrating biology. Uh, one of the things to follow from that is our program opportunity to create um, biology integration institutes. Um, we've, uh, for a number of years, had uh, one of the NSF big ideas, so-called big ideas of understanding the rules of life. And then we have integrated programs like dynamics of um, integrated socio-environmental systems or DISIS. We have the ecology and evolution of infectious disease, EEID, and the macro system biology, neon enabled science program. These are just examples. But um, the biology directorate has had um, uh, a, a sustained interest in integrating cross scales. And now in particular, especially with uh, neon coming online four years ago, um, uh, and with the other sources of open environmental data that can be uh, marshaled to understand phenomena at, at regional and even continental or larger scales, planetary scales, um, the biology directorate is, is interested in your help in helping us understand uh, where are things going? Where do they need to go? What do they, what do they need to get there? Um, so, uh, the next, um, few examples I'm going to run through just to get us to think boldly about things are, you know, uh, we want you to identify the questions, the ideas that, um, uh, frame where the next frontiers are going to be in understanding biological phenomena at the co continental scale. Um, what are the tools? How can we leverage those tools? Um, in, in the words, uh, I like to think of um, the movie, The Social Network, in which um, uh, they describe the uh, uh, coming of age of Facebook as um, the, the phrase is used, what is the next big thing, right? What is the next big application that's going to be critical to everyone that, that they want to be a part of, that they want to use, they want to want to obtain information with? Um, so what are the next big things when it comes to continental scale biology? And then um, finally, uh, you know, from a people perspective, um, uh, it's very important, particularly today, 
uh, how do we make continental scale biology equitable, inclusive, and make it relevant to society, make it relevant to the nation? Um, how is it going to be important for the future economic and other aspects of prosperity in our country? So next frontiers, some examples. We've been looking at data for uh, several decades now about increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. Where is all this CO2 going to go? It keeps increasing. Um, there are some who think that the soil and land is going to absorb most of it, perhaps as much as 80% of it. Um, certainly the ocean is going to play a part in absorbing some of it too. It's already having an impact. Uh, helping to acidify the ocean. You know, there's a, an old equation I learned in graduate school called the Henderson-Hasselbach equation that looks at how acid forms when you increase CO2 partial pressure. That's what we have going on in the ocean. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, how much of it is going to um, continue to fill up the atmosphere? That's the kind of big, bold question we need to answer in terms of understanding biological phenomena on the continent. How is uh, the CO2 going to impact, um, you know, the nation's forests, the uh, agriculture, uh, and soil fertility, for example? Um, another example, next frontier, is what is the future of Earth's biodiversity? Um, you know, what is the scope of biodiversity to begin with? Uh, we know that um, the, from, from the last several decades of, of work in, in microbial systems and sequencing genomes, that microbial diversity is, is far greater than we've been able to understand and sample. Um, what is happening to microbial biodiversity and how is that going to um, help shape uh, phenomena at continental scale? Um, how can we map diversity, whether it's microbes or birds, mammals, amphibians? Uh, how can we best map uh, their uh, location, their movement, their changes in life history and and phenology. Um, and then, of course, how does a biodiversity um, feedback into other uh, environmental change, right? We've got uh, uh, environmental change, climate change going on. We've got changes in land use patterns, changes in um, the human component of uh of Earth that and so so how is biology at continental scale going to be interacting with changes in in human behavior and human population numbers um, in 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 the economy in in the economic activities and how do these feed back on changes in biodiversity right um, uh, so then. From the perspective of what are the next big things, uh, how can we leverage infrastructure and open data? These are some examples of sources of open data. NEON, of course, the LTER network, um, the NASA satellite system uh, known as JEDI, um, uh, other sources of open data like um, the uh, the IDIG Bio Integrated Digitized Biological Collections and the Global Biodiversity Information System, GBIF. Lots of sources of open data. How can these be leveraged to understand uh, and capture what's going on in biology at continental scale? Um, and then, you know, as soon as you start to envision all this huge deluge of data, whether the data is in the form of satellite data or um, remote sensing data from the NEON airborne observational platforms or 
drone data or ground-based data or genomic data, um, uh, just huge amounts of data. What we need, of course, is to understand how computing is going to help understand and integrate all this information, whether it's machine learning, ML, um, artificial intelligence, cloud computing. Um, you know, I, I'm sure everybody's aware of the, the new chat G, GPT artificial intelligence tool. Um, it, it's unbelievable the impact that artificial intelligence is having uh, in environmental uh, analysis of, of large data sets. And, um, uh, you know, what, what are the tools that we need to best harness computing to leverage all of this open environmental data? You know, what is the vision for the next five to 10 to 20 years for continental scale biology? Um, uh, then uh, finally, we need to think about people, right? How is the science of continental scale biology going to be equitable, inclusive, and relevant to society? Um, one area that uh, NSF has begun um, uh, funding in part in this area is our newest synthesis center, the Environmental Data Science Innovation and Inclusion Lab, or EASL. And uh, a very significant portion of EASL's uh, efforts are are geared towards um, uh, building partnerships um, to enable more inclusive and equitable access to open environmental data. You know, uh, the data from something like NEON is available to anyone, not just people at large research universities. And so uh, the potential for um, harnessing um, uh, people power uh, and, uh, um, you know, the collective uh, zeitgeist of, of ideas that could be out there, whether they're at, at um, predominantly undergraduate institutes or large research universities, um, uh, there's a democratizing factor of, of open data that um, we want to help harness and We've charged this new synthesis center with helping us do that. The other thing that's really important to think about is something known as the bioeconomy. Um, a lot of times when people hear the word bioeconomy, they think of, um, you know, biotechnology and how biotechnology can produce economic impacts. But open environmental data at continental scale is going to be critical, for example, for understanding how fresh water resources are changing uh, and where they're going to be accessible and where they're not going, where they're going to be in short supply. It's going to be critical for understanding where fertile soil is going to be 20 to 50 years from now. That's going to have huge, huge impacts on our nation's economic prosperity. And being able to predict and understand these changes is really critical to society. Um, so we, we, we'd like this committee to, to think about the impact on people and the people's impact on uh, the future of continental scale biological science. And I think with that, I'll um, thank some uh, folks who I've had discussions with during the past couple of weeks about this talk. Uh, Liz Blood, Mike Brinford, Kyla Dolan, Jared Deshoff, Paul Hansen, and, and Anuj Karpatni, uh, um, and uh, of course, all my colleagues at NSF who support what we do. And I'll stop sharing slides and we can take uh, any questions you have. Yeah, thank you so much, um, uh, Ken, um, and for this very insightful, informative uh, presentation. This is really um, uh, useful for the committee and uh, to for us to think boldly and uh, big ideas and bigger frontier, new frontiers.
and uh, uh, new tools and also uh, relevant to society, create a, a um, equitable and inclusive um, community. I think those are the really important issues for us to keep in mind uh, when we uh, work on the report. And um, uh, I would like to open up for questions before I ask other people to ask you questions. Uh, as a chair, I will ask you the first question. And um, what specific expectation does NSF have regarding the uh, committee report? Um, so we want the report to be um, comprehensive, expansive. We want you to uh, not, we want you to be aware of the past. We want you to be cognizant of other reports. But um, uh, what we're looking for is a vision, right, for the future. We're looking uh, for um, help from you to identify from the National Academy to identify um, what kinds of investments and opportunities that NSF and other federal agencies um, need to be considering in the five to 10 to 20 year time frame. Uh, we want um, uh, your uh, insight into what sort of partnerships NSF and, and other agencies ought to be considering to help facilitate um, uh, making sure that um, we maximize the opportunity with understanding uh, biological phenomena at continental scale. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, um, well, we have some questions uh, before. And actually, I'm going to call uh, Bala to ask her uh, the next question. So thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi, Bala. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, okay, our next question is, um, how did or will NSF biology-related programs and other programs use previous reports like this in specifically in developing new initiatives? Um, so, uh, um, it, it, you know, I'm not sure I could answer that, to be honest. Um, uh, except to say that, um, you know, previous National Academy studies um, have had a very large impact on NSF program development, whether it's in areas like NEON, it had a huge impact on NSF um, rethinking and reorganizing the National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, uh, the NSF report on metagenomics had a huge impact on uh, focusing um, uh, NSF's attention on microbiome research. You know, when I first came to NSF 23 and a half years ago, I was the token microbiologist, um, and uh, uh, it's kind of um, uh, uh, says something very interesting that the person who's talking to you about understanding biology at continental scale came to NSF focused on the smallest organisms. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact is um, that uh that uh the uh continental scale biology the the organisms that may have the largest impact on changes at continental scale may be the smallest organisms because these are organisms that have a huge impact on uh producing and consuming for example atmospheric gases like co2 and methane nitrous oxide uh, um, dinitrogen gas, you know, the only organisms that can assimilate dinitrogen and uh, convert it into organic material are microorganisms. So um, uh, I think, think uh, these reports have a very large impact. Uh, you know, to be honest, it's hard to predict, but let's just say um, NSF doesn't uh, especially the biology directorate doesn't fund a lot of national academy studies. We we only 
uh, seek out that kind of input, frankly, they're they're quite expensive. You know, this study is costing NSF uh, more than seven hundred thousand dollars in U.S. taxpayer money, um, and so we only do it when we feel it's very important to have this high level expert impact to help us um, really develop an architectural plan for programmatic future. Thank you so much. Carl, you have a follow-up question or not? If not, we can move to the next one. No, I don't. I, you know, I thought your ideas, tools, people framework was really helpful. Yeah. So okay. those of you who are older than me will remember that was actually Rita Caldwell's conceptual framework for the National Science Foundation when she was the NSF director. Um, you know, people, ideas, and tools. Um, I sort of reverse the order there because, really, I think what what um, what will be the um, uh, you know most uh, fruitful focus for this group is probably going to be the ideas, the questions. And um, and how can they be framed, and what do we need to answer those questions? Great, thank you. Uh, Chelsea, could you ask the next one? Sure. I think you might have already answered it, though, Matt. The next mm -hmm. question that we had was, what are the what are some successful examples of previous? National Academy reports that have been used by NSF in developing new initiatives. And I believe in your previous answer, you talked a little bit about NEON and metagenetics. Yeah, metagenomics. Um, there's also, uh, um, you know, been uh, uh, a couple of reports from the board on uh, polar research, I believe. Um, and um, uh, uh, we... Um, you know, like I said, we we don't we don't fund a lot of uh, national academy studies. We only really um, make that investment when there's we 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 see there's a need and the timing is right. Um, uh, but I encourage you all to have a look at at those former reports. Um, uh, there's also one on uh, the role of theory in biological science. Um, I think one of the challenges that, um, in my experience, those folks who do continental scale work, one of the challenges they have is um, an over-focus on the geochemistry part of the story and an under-focus on biological phenomena. And what we're really looking from you uh, is um, uh, is understanding the biology at continental scale. What 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 do we need, you know, to to make the big advances there, um, both in terms of science and in terms of our society. Thank you. That's great. Um, any follow up, Jason? Okay. Great. Uh, Jack Gilbert, next one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jack. Well, Matt, um, uh, mine's more along the lines of trying to get a handle on how what NSF has learned from leading these large scale initiatives. What were the pain points? Uh, what were the policy issues that um, contextualized? The development of those programs right you know we don't exist in a vacuum research never exists in a mm -hmm. vacuum so right. if we are designing something at a continental scale or thinking about mm -hmm. how to implement work at a continental scale mm -hmm. understanding what went wrong or what went right previously mm -hmm. right especially with something like neon which you and i have a history with and then mm -hmm. um and then what went uh, what what policy decisions now should be taken into consideration when building these kinds of programs? Um, so I would caution the committee uh, about worrying too much about policy. Policy changes, right, mm -hmm. with the administration. Um, and, uh, and so um, I think over time, NSF has, has learned 
how to um, partner with the National Academy on these studies. And um, for example, from NSF's perspective, um, there's a lot of oversight that goes into our decision to fund a study that did not used to take place. So we have a whole committee that reviews um, any any you know any of our uh, directorates' desires to support in a national academy study. Um, really, they they have to be approved at the highest levels ultimately of NSF. Um, and so so we we have learned within NSF, NSF is is while we're a small government agency. It never ceases to amaze me how challenging it is for the left hand to know what the right hand is doing. And um, so we've, we've learned to not step on our own feet, I think, uh, um, o over time, especially with respect to supporting things like an NRC, a National Academy study. And um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, I would I would also caution you not to, on the one hand, be completely unrealistic about, um, you know, uh, financial investments. Um, you know, we're we're not going to um, fill the skies with, uh, you know, another um, thousand satellites to monitor the Earth system. Right? Uh, we don't have we need money to feed people on earth too. Um, uh, but on the other hand, don't be overly concerned about cost. Um, you know, we want you to think bold in a sensible way. Um, and so if that's going to require investment, I mean, I can tell you when I came to NSF 23 years ago, I never would have imagined that NSF would fund uh, a piece of biological infrastructure that costs close to half a billion dollars, which is what n building neon costs. Um, and so um, I think it is important to think boldly um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and identify where the needs really are for us to understand what we need to, to ensure um, you know, the, the uh, future health needs of our country uh, from public health perspective, the future uh, economic needs of our country, and certainly the future understanding from a scientific perspective. So no small tasks then. <laughs> That's why we have you, Jack. You yeah. know how to think big. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well Thank you so much. Uh, Ines, your next question. Um, I, I hope it's okay if I ask another question first that is not in the list. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. So um, one term that you have been using consistently is continental scale biology. Mm -hmm. And I know this is going to sound naive, but I wonder how should the committee define or interpret this term? Because I think it's something that we all may have mm -hmm. an idea of what it is, but what idea should we have when we think about this report? Um, well, I, I think what we want you to do in part is to, to help us uh, to think broadly and help us understand how NSF should be thinking about continental scale biology. I mean, certainly we know about phenomena like teleconnections in which, um, you know, forest transpiration rates in the West as they change have an impact on, um, on primary productivity in the East part of the continent, right? Um, uh, these kinds of phenomena have been um, those identified from our macro system biology and neon enabled science program. Um, but, you know, there's, there's lots of impacts that are happening at continental scale so that if, if um, plant, uh, you know, um, plants are, are blooming 
at earlier times. It has an impact on their pollinators. If their pollinators are emerging at a different time, it has an impact on the plants. Um, and this can impact, um, you know, entire biomes of, of where forest will move, where agriculture will be fertile in the future, where, um, uh, where, um, you know, uh, uh, new diseases might emerge. Um, uh, so, um, uh, it really, um, uh, continental scale isn't just thinking about continental scale also, it's thinking about connecting scales, right? From uh, organism uh, behavior and biomolecule synthesis uh, on up through the way um, uh, uh, life history changes uh, in populations to community level interactions to ecosystem, um, uh, you know, uh, s impacts and ecosystem services. Um, and, and then getting beyond individual ecosystems to interactions between ecosystems. But those interactions are also dependent on these, these local scale uh, interactions. Uh, some people, I think, um uh have been concerned that that um scientific advances in areas like remote sensing are somehow uh going to make other types of studies of uh, uh, ground based studies for example obsolete and i'm i'm quite certain that's far from the truth um you know the connection between studies at at different scales and how to do them properly and what's needed to do them properly um, is a, a very important part of, of the vision you're going to explore. Thank you. This was very, uh, very good. Um, I think I'm the next person asking a question. Um, let me see, these keep jumping. Is NSF interested in any kind of theoretical perspective to be sure. reflected in this report? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, uh, identifying new theoretical foundations or new theory that needs to be developed to understand uh, continental scale biological phenomena. That's um, uh, certainly part of it. You know, um, sometimes in, in my long tenure at NSF, um, I've encountered people that think great biological discoveries always happen. Um, by investing in in theory driven research, others who think biological driven discoveries happen by investing in technology driven research, and the truth from my perspective is that both are essential uh, and complementary. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, um, Scott. Um, I saw you have questions on the sheet. Um, also, before you log on, uh, the committee member had a brief uh, introduction to um, just your name and the affiliation. So before you answer the, uh, ask the questions. Okay, yeah, I'm Scott Getz. I'm a professor at Northern Arizona University and sorry to join a little bit late. I had some connectivity issues. Hi, Scott. But, uh, hi, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Uh, the next question is, um, I think you've actually mostly already answered it, but would you like us to identify data and knowledge gaps across scales and point out new techniques or approaches to link scales? And I think you just addressed that. Yeah, so the answer is yes. <laughs> I, can, I can be concise for once. Yes, yeah, the question is the best. Way to go about that, but that, I guess that's our that's our task. I will say you mentioned you know this Jedi uh, lidar on the space station. I'm involved with that. There's a whole bunch of other satellite missions in the pipeline already. You're probably aware of, yeah, uh, big ones. So there'll be lots to leverage there, and I think there's other people on this committee who are knowledgeable of those as well. Right, so. and, and and the challenge, Scott, from my perspective, is how can that information be used to understand biology. Agreed. And I can think of several ways off the bat, but yeah, we, we can talk about that. Great. Any other questions? 
from the committee members? You can raise your hand now. <laughs> or just talk, Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah, I um, Matt, uh, strategic as always. Um, I was I was very interested to hear you. Uh, thinking about some of the ways that continental scale biology can relate to the bioeconomy. Um, clearly, this has been a national priority for quite some time in many different mm -hmm. forms. And right now, we have uh, the new directorate, Technology Innovations and Partnerships, mm -hmm. that is just standing up. And so I think it's, I mean, so clearly, so there's a comment here, which is um, that I think that the committee will be uh, be interested in, in, in thinking about that more broadly. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's anything that you would want to say more specifically about the sorts of activities um, that you think that we should be aware of as the new directorate is coming online or other things associated with bioeconomy might be active at NSL or, or elsewhere. So um, uh, I don't know. Um... I can't really say anything specific related to activities in our new directorate, the technology innovation and partnerships tip. Um, uh, for one thing, you know, it's funding is, is ramping up over time, we hope. Uh, and it's begun with a, a big, uh, you know, the, a good portion of the increase to NSF's budget is going to help build that directorate. Um, but, I, I do think we in the bio directorate have been working very hard at uh, trying to help TIP, um, the, our colleagues in TIP understand all the different ways that biology um, has applications that, um, you know, provide uh, new opportunities. So for example, um, when they think of biology, again, they, they immediately want to go to biotechnology. That's that's an obvious um, low-hanging fruit, so to speak, to invest in. Um, but um, they uh, wouldn't necessarily think about conservation, right? Conservation is a really, really important aspect of uh, applied biology. And, um, you know, when you think about what makes our nation wealthy, OK, if you if you spend much time in other parts of the world, you'll see one of the things that really makes it, it's not it's not that everybody's holding cell phones. You know, you can go to lots of developing countries and everybody has a cell phone. What makes our country wealthy is the incredible amount of natural resources and land uh, and public space that are being conserved and that we're trying to conserve more. Right. And so we have a new partnership in the bio directorate with the Paul Allen Foundation uh, uh, for uh, un, uh, it's a partnership to uh, uh, support advances in conservation science. Uh, um, and um, and so we're 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 uh, talking with Tri TIP, our partners in TIP and and um, and uh, and trying to help them understand why things like that are are um, areas of potential interest for for NSF's ap applied biology investment. So um, uh, when we think uh, about phenomena, biological phenomena at continental scale, you know you could you can certainly see how uh, conservation issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've, you've heard the expression, I think it's something like 30 at 30, right? 30% 30 of, of, uh, the land would be under conservation by 2030 that, that will have a very big impact on, on continental scale biology. Uh, Bala, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of jump off of a couple um, partnerships you mentioned. So this recent foundation partnership, mm -hmm. and then you were sort of hinting at disease ecology. And mm -hmm. this was a, a, something that came up in our initial discussions mm -hmm. around 
um, partnerships with other agencies and mm -hmm. kind of cross agency collaborations. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you see that as within our purview in, in kind of making future recommendations. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly first, I'd encourage you to explore um, the, the amount of interaction and collaboration that goes on. You know, the federal government's a very big thing, right? Uh, 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 unfortunately, it's not a new big thing. It's not the latest big thing. It's a big thing that's been around for a long time. And um, so even though NSF does partner with the USDA um, and with NIH in various ways and with NASA, um, uh, uh, as well as with private foundations, and I'm really speaking particularly of the biology directorate. And we, we also even have partnerships with science agencies in other countries, right? With uh, partners in Brazil and in China and South Africa. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I would encourage you to understand what the current scope of, of some of these are in areas like ecology and evolution of infectious disease or biodiversity on a changing planet, um, uh, some examples in which we have a lot of partnership. Um, uh, but um, also to think what does make sense from the perspective of understanding continental scale biology to have economies of scale in collaboration between agencies and partnerships between agencies. Um, you know, there, there's always a, a, a challenge in, in Washington, D.C. for, um, you know, research dollars. And um, so the extent to which agencies can cooperate and collaborate uh, to provide what you folks, what scientists need, what the nation needs in terms of of investment um, uh, helps us all. Great. Any other questions from other committee members? Oh, she hit. Yeah, so I had, a, um, as, as often the case for me, somewhat abstract question. But, um, you know, um, I was thinking, if you think about our charge, which is, you know, research at multiple scales, you could ask that about how research is conducted at multiple scales. And I was thinking, you know, I'm president of ESA right now, and the last time I went to the meetings, it just was a reminder to me how you have the individuals studying an endangered salamander in some temporary pond someplace. Mm -hmm. And you have teams of researchers working on, you know, uh, uh, um, remote sensing and, and eddy flux towers and so forth. And I don't see, you know, I feel that there is the possibility that the individual researcher might have some interesting insights, especially now that they can download this mm -hmm. data, these data from places like Neon and 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 and, and mm -hmm. what uh, the tools that ISO will provide and so forth, mm -hmm. or Easel, as you say. Um, and um, um, but I was wondering, you know, if I look at the NSF uh, funding patterns, um, and you, you I'm sort of curious, do you feel that they are actually structured in a way that doesn't facilitate the charge of the committee in that? You know, there are people who want to do a systematic revision of the hummingbirds will go to this particular place. People who want to study large scale things will, will, will go to other panels or look for these occasional um, RFPs that come out looking for multi institutional, multi institutional, and it won't actually facilitate the idea that we could have, you know, very, uh, very large scale people looking at tiny things and people looking at tiny things start to look at big things. But it's a bit abstract, but I was wondering what you thought about that. Uh, I, I, so I'm not sure if there's a question there, Shahid, uh, yeah. or just just some some thought provoking thoughts. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's but, the story of my 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 life. I'll, I'll um, try to make a question out. Yeah. Um, so so what, what what I was asking is, do you think that the current structure of NSF is going to actually be an impediment to what you know the the idea of a facilitating right. continental research? So I'm I'm really glad you asked that in that way because then I get to use one of um, my most favorite sayings that people like Stephanie and others have heard me say many times, which is the great thing about NSF is, you know, we do 85 to 90% of what we do very well. 
and we spend 50% of our time figuring out how to do the rest better. Okay. And, um, and so NSF, it's hard for me to think of a more dynamic um, agency or organization, um, you know, that, that funds research than NSF. We're, um, we're, we're always evaluating what we're doing. We're always, um, uh, um, you know, trying to um, understand whether the way we're um, positioned uh, is is providing uh, the most we can to the community, um, because as 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 good as I think we do at at providing opportunities to the community for funding, given our small budget, um, the fact is the people we fund squeeze blood out of a turnip. And, uh, you know, we, we, we give them probably less than half of what they need, and they produce uh, amazing results with taxpayer money. I like to tell my family, all of whom are non-scientists, uh, that their tax dollars that go to NSF are some of the best spent tax dollars that there are because of, of this you know, tremendous efficiency provided by, um, you know, mostly university-based researchers. Um, and so uh, we're constantly asking ourselves, Shahid, can we do it better? Can we organize ourselves better? We absolutely encourage you to look at that question as well. Um, we'd love to hear, you know, the, the we, we know what the insights are from an insider's perspective. Um, uh, and a NSF also very, very strongly believes in bringing in outside advice. That's why our, all of our directorates have external advisory committees and why uh, all of our divisions every four years undergo what we call a committee of visitors where we bring people in to give us external advice. So, I mean, you know, uh, um, we're we're nothing without you, right? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you so much. We're <laughs> almost all run out of time. Cliff, you have any other things to say before we close this session? I uh, don't think so. Uh, I would like to very much thank uh, Matt for the uh, presentation and the committee for the discussion. And for those of you who have noticed, Chelsea has been taking terrific notes on our questions, which I'm sure the committee will find helpful. Uh, and uh, the, one other uh, question or comment I would I would make to Matt is uh, if the committee has additional questions um, that uh, we can email to you, I, I hope that you might be willing to uh, respond. Absolutely. Any way I can help, please let me know. Um, anytime, you know, you, you'd like to provide an opportunity for me or NSF, uh, other NSF staff to, um, to, uh, listen in to, um, things going on on the committee We're you know, we're very, very interested in, in what you're doing. We, we recognize the independent nature of, of, you know, of what's going on. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we, we, it's, it's a partnership, you know? Great. Thank you so much again, Matt, for your really insightful, informative presentation and also very, very helpful uh, answers to our questions and uh, and also appreciate your willingness to continue answer our questions or provide the information that we need. Um, so thanks again. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, yeah. Cliff. And again, thanks to everybody on the committee for yeah. Um, your time in this effort. We really appreciate it. Yeah, for Thank the committee, you. we'll uh, log out here, but we will uh, go to another Zoom link and uh, on the program book that I can send you. Okay, 305. See you. Right. Yeah. Bye, Matt. Bye.